doctor, Dr. Goldberg. Oh, well, this is the truth of uh, consequence time. Well, it was very much the desire of my father to go to medical school when he was a young man. Yeah. And because of the uh, depression, he was unable to. And he certainly made uh, his dream my dream. So it was very much his influence. Um, I don't want to say I was reluctant, but I was certainly following through with his, his dream. Where did you go to medical school? Pardon me? Where did you go to medical school? I went to medical school at Upstate Medical Center in Syracuse, uh, New York. I was there. I graduated in 1965, and I stayed uh, for one year of residency there. And I did that in internal medicine, and I followed that with a year of internal medicine in Indiana University Medical Center. And after that, I was drafted into the Army in 1967 for two years. What made you choose internal medicine? It was very much a result of uh, my experience as a third year medical student. There were two, uh, two doctors on a ward at the VA hospital, Freddie Schmaze and Bernie Pixley, both of whom practice in Massachusetts, as it turns out. And they were very charismatic and great teachers and made internal medicine very exciting and interesting. And I put a lot of fun at that time. And I wanted to be like them. <laughs> and that's why I went into internal medicine. Okay. Well, before we move on and start talking about your practice, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Any stories, stories you have from medical school, your residency, or your military service? I have, you know, I, I think every doctor has, has lots of stories uh, about medical school. Many of them are very personal, you know feelings of, oh my God, how can I possibly do this, or how can I get through this night, or do I know what I'm doing? But eventually, you know, we all managed to get through those things. My experience in the Army was unique because there, there is no chief resident, there is no chief of medicine. You, for the first time in your life, you're really on your own and treated like an adult, and, and like a lot of people. I went, in, I went into the Army as a boy and came out as a man. Uh, I think that was a common experience of a lot of people. Um, I've, I've spent several rotations in the VA hospital and, and I liked that a lot. Um, and I think that led to my later career at, in the VA. Um, I also saw the, while in, while in medical school, that you know, it was really important. The most critical thing a doctor can do is to be a good listener. And they're trying to absorb what you're hearing. Uh, I paid attention to that. And I, that's about all I want to say about that. No, there, there are no great war stories. Sorry. Except that internship was like being in combat, I guess. <laughs> and uh, I managed to survive just barely. <laughs> How much did it cost for you to go to medical school? $25. $25. I had a New York State Regents Scholarship for medical oh. school. And I can only imagine how much it costs now. Yeah. And uh, it was nice that I had no debt and that I could choose whatever pra profession I wanted to, whatever specialty I wanted to. The debt today for the medical students is obscene. I think I've lost my clip. <laughs> So I, ha I had a bunch of scholarships, and it turned out my total cost for medical school was $25. Now, compared with the debt that the students have today of $35,000 a year, which is absolutely obscene, uh, and it puts money into the equation for the first time, and it really shouldn't. I think doctors are making decisions about their practice, their lifestyle, how much they charge patients, how much money they expect to get out because of this incredible debt. And, I, and it's my belief that this is not a, has not been a good thing for medicine, that we're seeing doctors making hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, which is uh, much more than the average worker is doing. Uh, and it's driving the cost, it's helping to drive the cost of medicine out of the reach of millions of Americans. So what year did you start practicing? Started practicing in 1971. 
I, I worked in a group practice in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Now this, this group practice was way ahead of its time, but there a lot of stuff as outpatients uh, and at a reduced cost. And our reward from uh, the various insurance carriers and Medicare and Medicaid was not to pay us. So that at the end of six months we were, we were in debt and bankrupt. And since I was a new doctor, I had to sell my house and relocate in Marlboro, Massachusetts. This was my first experience with the uh, insurance industry and the state government. And I saw them as basically people who did not pay their bills on time, who said one thing and delivered on another, who promised lots of benefits and failed to deliver on them. Uh, and it was pretty disappointing. Uh, the doctors who stayed in Gloucester uh, were in debt for many, many years before they were able to uh, pay off their, their debt. And again, the whole idea, you, know, you, you want your, I think the patient would want his physician to be thinking only of their health and not worried about how he was going to pay the mortgage and so forth. So describe a typical day of practice. Well, that's been very different. You know, I've, I've worked in several different locations. I worked in private practice in Gloucester, private practice in the Marlboro area for seven years. I worked at UMass Medical Center for five years. I worked for St. Vincent Hospital, the Harvard Community Health Plan, and the VA. So but rather than answer that question, I'll just say that I may be a new example. I may be an example of the new pattern of practice, which is that there is no pattern that doctors, instead of taking one job and staying their entire lifetime, which was the pattern when I was training, are now being replaced by doctors who take several jobs during their lifetime. When I, when I started practicing, when I went to medical school, the typical physician was in solo practice by himself, an independent practitioner, independent businessman, whose only allegiance of any kind was to his patients. Now the average physician is employed or working for a group practice where certainly he has allegiance to his or different organizations that he has to share with his allegiance to his patients. His patient allegiance may be first, but I think it's, I think it's something we has to, it's shared. But a typical day of one of these situations would be, I was at early bird, I got to the hospital about 7, 7.30, made my rounds, uh, took care of business, Got to my office 10, 11 o'clock, depending upon where I was. Would practice right through to about 5 o'clock in the office. See about three or four patients an hour, plus and minus. Call it a day at 5, 5.30. And generally try and go home for supper sometime with my family and my kids. And depending upon where I was in these different, different areas, I would then go back to the hospital, see a sick patient, check a few sick patients in the hospital. Be on call about every third or fourth night, every third or fourth weekend, cover the practice of some other people. I found that to be very, very difficult um, to come in in the middle of a, of a prolonged acute illness for somebody who was in the hospital to try and pick up the thread of four or five years of a medical illness that was ongoing and really focus in and deliver the appropriate care I found to be pretty difficult. So hospital rounds on the weekend seem to take forever. Yeah, do you want to talk more about the hospital rounds and maybe how they've changed over the years? Sure. Well, when I was in private practice by myself, there was just me going around on hospital rounds. Uh, I was it. Uh, sometimes a nurse would come around, sometimes not. Uh, in the smaller hospitals, the nurses would know the patients pretty well. They would know them less well in the larger hospitals. And also the nurses are only covering a third of the day. And you may not have, had, you may not have spoken to the nurse who observed a critical piece of clinical information. And that information may be translated to the next nurse who then writes it down. And that third nurse may, may be the person who tells you what's going on. So that's kind of difficult. At a place like the VA or University Hospital, 
you make grads as a team, as an entourage of students and interns and residents and attendings and nurses and pharmacists and social workers and you name it. And there, the purpose of the rounds seems to be more of a teaching experience rather than a therapeutic experience for the patient. I also felt that when you have more than one person going on rounds, the patient's confidentiality is, is obviously and immediately compromised. Uh, with so many people looking at the medical records, the whole issue of patient confidentiality today is gone, zero. I mean, it doesn't exist. It exists in your dreams. Everybody has access to medical records, all kinds of reviewers, insurance companies, social workers, this person, lawyers, administrators, state regulators, Medicare, Medicaid, HICFA, they all got their, they all got their thumb in the pot. Um, but one way of getting around that is to, is, to, is to practice in code, you know? Patients don't have gonorrhea, they have a gram negative diplococcal infection. Uh, <laughs> Interestingly, in the Army, you know, in the Army, your medical record is not yours. There's no, there's no uh, knowledge of, conf there's no aspect of confidentiality. Your medical record belongs to your commanding officer. So, you know, there's these married guys that have got a rear or whatever, right, or whatever, and then they tell you this stuff and want treatment, and you would have to, what would you write down? I mean, how could you do it, you know? So, you, you thought, of, thought of a way of writing some of this stuff in code, you know, so wouldn't compromise their career, and it shouldn't. Why should their medical care have anything to do with anything else that goes on? So, did I answer the question? Yeah, that was perfect. Um, how else would you communicate with your patients outside of the office and outside of the hospital? Well, I, I tried to spend a lot of time giving information to my patients. I thought that was the in internal medicine, where we can cure very few diseases like diabetes or hypertension, being a source of information is one of the primary things that, that an internist does. And spent a lot of time trying to get that information to the patients. Um, I never had used a lot of pamphlets or videotapes. Or I, I, I retired before the computer age really became really evident. I just try and do it face to face. Now, I, I told my patients I had an answering service. I always had an answering service. I always provided 24-hour coverage for my patients. And when the patients were discharged from the hospital, I always gave them written instructions. Uh, one of my fellow docs, Larry Dowen, taught me how to do that. Just, just made, write up the instructions in triplicate. I gave one to the patient, one I kept in the medical record, and one I took back to my office. And this is not rocket science, you know. And that's, that's how... Uh, and today people say, this is how you do it, and there's a federal law that says you have to do it this way. And we've been doing it a long time ago. Did you ever make house calls at any point? Yeah, I actually did. And in Gloucester, when I was first started practicing, house calls were a tradition. And uh, I was, was once called to see a patient who was very sick. And the family, one family member called me, another family member called another doctor. <laughs> so we both arrived simultaneously at the, at the bedside of this poor, sick old soul. And uh, he was only too happy to leave, and I was only too happy to see the new patient who was pretty sick and admitted him. I found that uh, taking care of acutely sick patients in their home was a tremendous waste of time. You almost always had to call an ambulance and get them to the hospital. Difficult to examine patients in their homes. Are they jaundiced? Are they not jaundiced? What's their blood pressure? What's their temperature? The lighting isn't good, etc. But on the other hand, over the years, I, I would say, with a little bit of regularity, several times a year, I would go, I would go make house calls on people who were really housebound or who were really who were dying. I would do that. I thought that was a service to my patients, to my community. I didn't expect to get paid a lot for that. Um, and I just did it. I didn't do it often, but when I did do it, the, the patients were uniformly very grateful. Uh, I once was taking care of a sick boy who had cancer, and I couldn't find his house. And I drove around and around and around, and it was in these little cottages in uh, Gloucester.
Uh, and I went back to the office. And they called me, they were all crying, aren't you gonna come, we're waiting for you. God, I never realized. I mean, I, I, I think I realized for the first time the incredible impact the doctor has on the lives of, of very sick patients, especially those who are very dependent upon him. It really, you know, certainly uh, was an incredible experience for me. And I went back to this little cottage and I, right away, and, or that night, and, and with good directions and found them and did a little care. So that, that'd be the kind of house calls they made. I remember though when I was a, uh, in the army and I lived on the fourth floor walk up and my kid had a fever of 104. I called the pediatrician and he walked up four flights of stairs on a Monday night, on a, on a some evening about eight o'clock at night and came up and examined my kid. I said, wow, there are some incredible docs out there working really hard. Alexander Monday, that was his name, Alexander Monday. And I also want to say there's a great series of photographs from Life magazine in the 1940s of a doctor in Colorado who makes a home delivery. And they show him working there. It's just fabulous. Generally, who were your patients? What types of people were they? Did you see people of all ages? Well, in the VA for the past 10 years, of course, they were all veterans. Yeah. And they were mainly uh, middle-aged to elderly men, 5% women maybe, who had served in the armed forces. And uh, basically of a, I would say a middle class or slightly less socioeconomic group. Um, when I worked for the Harvard Community Health Plan, the patients would, were of a much higher socioeconomic group, and there, there was a big difference. The patients in the Harvard Plan had a lot of expectations uh, and were very demanding of service uh, and immediately. The veterans, on the other hand, were very grateful to be alive, to have survived combat, were thankful for the medical care they were receiving and uh, period. <laughs> what do you think it's been like for your family to have a physician in the household? Yeah, you know, you should ask my kids that question, you know, because yeah. we have two different perceptions about that. I thought I was a pretty good dad. I was working pretty hard to come home and spend time with my kids and play with them and be with them and do things with them. Well, I guess it just wasn't their point of view. Their point of view was I was pretty distant and uh, pretty judgmental and I could have been a better father. And of course I had a, I got divorced in the middle of my practice. So, and being, being a doctor contributed to my divorce, I don't think so. I think I would have gotten divorced anyway. Did you take vacations during the vacation? Yeah, I always took vacation. I always, I th I always knew that was important. I always met, found somebody to cover for me. I was always in a, I was always in a situation where I had some, some coverage. And I, I think that was important. That's part of the collegiality of medicine, you know. I'll cover you, you cover me. Uh, we're in this boat together. Um, and I think that's an important part of the whole, the positive part of medicine is that you know, we're, we're colleagues, you know, we're not competitors. This isn't, you know, uh, a couple of shoe stores on the corner. These, these are people, you know, but we're colleagues. I'm taking care of your patients. You're taking my, care of my patients. We're members of the same hospital, members of the same community. Our basic goal is the health of our patients. And that's an important thing. Has that aspect of medicine remained the same to you? I'd like to believe it is. Um, that would be interesting to hear what other people have to say about that. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, hope, I hope it is. I hope it is. Okay. Well, let's move on to sure. the science of your practice. Now, what were the most typical illnesses that you dealt with early on? Well, let me, I'll, I saw that question, I want to answer that a little differently. Okay. And, you know, when I, when I was early on, there was so much peptic ulcer disease that we saw both in the office and in the hospital. People would be hospitalized for all different kinds of procedures for their stomach. 
That was only 35 years ago. It's unheard of today. It's rare because this is due to the fabulous medications that are available to treat ulcer disease. And even though these medications are expensive, nevertheless, they have changed, they have certainly decreased the hospital days for the treatment of peptic ulcer disease. So I, my guess is that the net experience for the community is, is a smaller cost. So I'm not sure that the, 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 the increasing cost of pills is a bad thing. I think it's taking more and more of the practice of medicine out of the hospital to an inpatient, to at, from out of the hospital to outpatient, and thereby making the cost of medicine less. And so it's not really, so if you want to look at what's happened to the cost of medicine, look at all the diseases that are now being treated at home as opposed to being at the hospital. So no peptidols. Coronary artery disease, the treatment of coronary artery disease when I was a resident was bed rest. Yeah. That's all you had to do was, there was, no def there was no coronary care unit. When I was a resident at Boston City Hospital, we actually, we actually, the residents and nurses actually built a coronary care unit. Uh, there were almost no med medications. When I first started, Xylac when I was an intern, Xylocaine, which had been used for years as a local anesthetic, was first introduced for treating cardiac uh, arrhythmias, like ventricular tachycardia. And that seemed to revolutionize things. And it wasn't until, geez, late, sometime in the 1970s, that was really shown that surgery for coronary artery disease was a worthwhile thing to do. So this has been a dramatic ch change to more and more and more intervention for coronary artery disease, which is certainly the number one killer in our society, the number one disease you see in the office, the number one problem you worry about with your patients, because sudden death is a, uh, is, a, is, a is the way it presents frequently. Um, we try to spend a fair amount of our time doing preventive medicine, getting patients to stop smoking, and you know, there actually has been success with men in the United States. Adult men have stopped smoking. Uh, less so, teen but unfortunately, the teenagers are starting all over again to smoke. Uh, but when, this, when I started out, there would be ads with physicians smoking and saying, this, this was good for your T-zone and so forth. But almost immediately upon, almost immediately in the 1950s, early 60s, that stopped and hundreds of thousands of doctors quit smoking when a certain general report came out that linked cigarette smoking to uh, lung cancer. So there's been a big change in that regard. Um, the other big change has been when I was a medical student, abortion was a crime. And there were very few doctors who knew, knew anything about abortions who knew how to counsel patients for abortion or to send them. But by the time I got to medical school, people in Syracuse were doing abortions, a few of them, and they weren't being prosecuted. It was sort of like a gray zone, you know? Just in limbo. Um, and the whole issue of women's health was non-existent then. Now there's women health specialists, you know? Like, I'll, I'll pass up my, my comments upon that. I'll stop right there. Okay. okay. So you would say that the coronary artery disease has always been the most challenging, always the hardest for you to deal with? No, I would say it's a challenge, not, not necessarily the hardest. Some of the, the metabolic diseases and the hematologic diseases, especially the diseases of coagulation, where the biochemistry is so complex, where there are tw or at least 12 different factors of coagulation and trying to figure out which one is absent in your patient or deficient is really hard to do. But as far as, you know, what's the, the, the number one overall biggest issue in healthcare, and probably treating coronary artery disease. What have you seen as one of the most important breakthroughs in disease treatment throughout your career? I, I would think that the the continuing application of appropriate technology when I was a medical student, 
routine blood tests had to be ordered by a specialist. You couldn't do a serum electrolytes. They were done by flame photometer. Uh, nuclear scanning was only about the thyroid gland. The CAT scan hadn't been invented. Coronary arteriography hadn't been invented. Um, so I think this technology is, is the, obviously the, the critical change. The downside of that is that because it's there, it can also be used inappropriately. And, and an example of that would be these whole body scans in asymptomatic people. Yeah. I mean, there's not a scintilla of evidence that that's a worthwhile thing to do. That probably the, it may be that the majority of lesions that they discover are benign and have no significance, except that if you start taking them out, you start giving anesthesia and running a risk of hurting somebody. So it's the appropriate use of this technology, a real critical issue in medicine. Well, again, just to go back to and reiterate, because I think it's worth saying, the accumulated knowledge over the years that cigarette smoking is the cause of many diseases, coronary artery disease, lung cancer, emphysema would be the three most important, but also throat cancer and bladder cancer, among others, and peripheral vascular disease of all kinds. The, the work on, on people to developing uh, campaigns to stop smoking, I mean, just the mindset to do something as opposed to doing nothing. From going from doctors and advertising to having an organized community campaign to get people to stop smoking, a comprehensive one. No ashtrays in your offices, no smoking signs in the hospitals, making the hospitals no smoking zones. Really important, that's giving a message day in, day out that we really, really care about this. The fact that doctors don't smoke, you really see a doctor smoking. The fact that every November there's a national smoke out day where, there, where the media is inundated with all kinds of messages. The fact that Massachusetts Health Department has a well-organized anti-smoking campaign with really good ads on television. The fact that all different kinds of, almost every hospital has a, has a smoking cessation clinic, has um, programs for stopping smoking, including, and they're actually, they're actually now showing that by the use of nicotine patches and or uh, oh, Wellbutrin, as a anti Wellbutrin medicine and a program of uh, support, has actually helped significant numbers of people stop smoking. And I'm saying to you as proof number, positive proof that you can stop smoking. It'll be exactly 20 years and 23 days that I stop smoking. Excellent. So just uh, getting people to break this one habit, that, that can stop so many diseases, right? Um, it would revolutionize healthcare. Uh, it would. Um, but I think it's been the major the major preventive. Now, we've also, as part of this, we've also learned some other things, you know, the whole idea of preventive medicine has taken hold in the consciousness. You can prevent cervical cancer, the cervix with pap smears, I think most women understand that. You can prevent colon cancer with testing for blood in the stool and different kinds of endoscopes. And I think the majority of people is starting to get involved in this. And you may be able to prevent breast cancer with a mammography that's still debatable. We like to think that we can. <laughs> the jury is the jury is probably in favor of that, but hasn't reached a final decision yet. So I think the the population now knows about preventive medicine. This is not something new. And now they think that there are this, that diseases can be prevented by modifying your diet not eating as much sugar or saturated fat. Uh, unfortunately, the food industry in general is very slow to promote healthy food. You know, they still put a lot of synthetic hormones and antibiotics into cattle and poultry. Uh, still really, you know, you, you see a box of something that's labeled and you see there's 200 calories in two-thirds of a cup. When was the last time you measured two-thirds of a cup? <laughs> It's not helpful to people. 
What's something that doctors seem to take for granted now in terms of technology that you didn't have at some point in your practice? I'm not sure I can follow you. Uh, I don't know, what, what new technology... Well, I mean, what technology is used nowadays is new to you. I mean, what didn't you have in your practice? Well, the M MRIs came into general use very late in my career. And this was, just a, this was just a pipe dream that could really image the whole body with no radiation. I mean, it was a, just an incredible concept. Um, how useful is it? I, I, think, I, I think, I don't want to say how useful it is it is, and that would be like criticizing a baby because he can't run. I think these are newly discovered tools and they become increasingly uh, sophisticated as time goes by. What technology is still used in medicine that you used early in your career in, in medical school? EKG, chest x-ray. Right. EKG is a fabulous test. It's very cheap. It's totally safe. It gives you an incredible amount of information you can get only in one place. I want to answer, I want to divert about that for a second and say that uh, the federal government has come into medicine in, in, in lots of different ways, some good, some bad, but here's a bad way. They have forbidden students to learn how to, uh, they, have, they have essentially forbidden students and residents to, to read uh, blood smears and urine tests and do any kind of laboratory testing by themselves and in an official way so that people no longer are, are skilled in this. I mean, students coming out now have no idea what a, you know, a nucleated red blood cell looks like because I've never seen one except in a picture, you know, in a book or something. I've never had the experience of looking for them. And I think that's not a good thing. I think, I think the government should get out of telling the doctors what to do and not to do. I think too many, a few too many rules and regulations. Uh, describe one important invention that you've seen and tell me when that came into medicine. I think it's the whole concept of, of applying basic science to clinical practice of medicine, of uh, learning, for example, the biochemistry of how the angiotensin reading system involves controlling your blood pressure and actually marketing medications to block different pieces of, of that pathway to affect the therapeutic response. And similar today in the New England Journal of Medicine, there's an article about how uh, knowledge of the biochemistry of some bioproliferative diseases uh, enables the pharmaceutical industry to actually come in and target one step in that complex biochemical process to block it. That's amazing. It's, it's all conceptualization. I mean, you can't see that. It doesn't exist anywhere. It only, it only exists in a person's brain, you know. If I can only block this phosphorylation, I could cure this disease. And apparently it's working for some of these diseases. It's pretty exciting. I think the molecular basis of medicine is just very, very exciting, that people are really, really coming to understand why some of these diseases happen, what the genetic susceptibility of patients is, how that's coupled with environmental exposure to whatever, and all this is, comes together to make you healthy or sick. It's kind of neat. Yeah. Did you have access to new technology throughout your career? Variable, wasn't it? Depending upon the economic fortunes of the institutions that you were in. Uh, you would or would not. For example, the VA is very cash-strapped, and in the 10 years I worked there, I think I ordered an MRI one or two times, and it was just an in incredible administrative hassle to get it done. What would you like to see invented in the field of medicine? Invented? Yeah. Oh. Anything you I don't think there's a specific invention that's needed. Uh, I think we need more of a commitment to basic biochemic, bio, biological research. Uh, more study on appropriate application of that research to clinical medicine rather than being driven by 
utilitarianism rather than profit. And the invention of universal health care for everybody in the United mm -hmm. States. <laughs> That's more than, than any technology. I'll give you an example of that. I'll, let me expand upon that right now. In Canada, spends 50 cents, 50% 50 less per patient for the total health care than they do in the United States. They have universal health care. And any, every single piece of information you want to measure, whether it's life expectancy, birth weight, no matter what, they are better than or equal to the United States. We do twice as much coronary arteriography, twice as much of everything in the United States, and the outcome is the same. So the key to better health is not another invention. It's application of what we know today to everybody. Because this man works at a gas station, has no health insurance, doesn't mean that his health should be jeopardized. Okay. I may have jumped the gun there, but... No, no, that's fine. What were some of the most important drugs that you used in your practice early on, and how did those change over the years? There were two drugs that really stand out for being revolutionary. Okay. The first one was cimetidine, which is a, a drug used to treat peptic ulcer disease. People would come in who had chronic daily pain for years and years. Within a few days, the pain went away and never came back. Magic. It's magic. And the hospital wards were emptied of peptic ulcer disease, like, like a plague had been lifted from the land. Um, and, you know, and, and, and people, you know, you're giving me an ulcer, for example, would be, you know, you're bothering me. You never hear that people say that anymore, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, the other medication was, was propranolol or indorol. And um, this was done for the, for the basis of some good biochemistry done in the middle of the 20th century. And it was, it was shown that this medication clearly clearly protected people from coronary artery disease, both symptomatically and probably also for survival. And you know that, that in Worcester there was a big project run by UMass for many years, a heart project, and the single most important thing they saw between survivors and non-survivors was in the survivor group, people were using more Indorol than in the non-survivors group. And since Indorol was also used very useful. It was a very good drug for treating hypertension. Wow. Now you got a two, two bangs for the buck. You got a very safe, inexpensive, very, very useful and easy to use drug. Man, I mean, I mean you, know, you, you know, instead of going through all these mental gymnastics of what were you going to do with this and that, all of a sudden you just give the patient in the role and send him on his way. Very impressed. I can't think of any other two medicines like that. The only other medicine I think about, I just heard about, is this new medication for the treatment of chronic myelogenous leukemia that seems to be work like magic. But anyway, I don't, I'll pass over that. I don't, know, I don't know much about that. How have changes in the drug industry affected your practice over the years? In the very beginning, when I was a young, naive person, and wanted to be everybody's friend. Uh, I thought that the drug representatives wanted to be my friend too. And I quickly learned that that was not, may not necessarily been true. And um, I was once on a farm, I was once head of the pharmacy committee at, at Marlboro Hospital. And we substituted one drug for another because it was less expensive and just as good. I was personally th threatened with a lawsuit by the drug company involved. And I realized then at an early age that these people were not necessarily my friends or friendly. And since that time forward, I refused to deal with them. I just personally no longer believe that, that the representatives are there, anything other than to sell their drug. 
They're trying to ingratiate themselves with the doctors by offering this, that, and everything else, and I just don't want to do it. When I go to conventions, I see the booths everywhere. I'll, I'll take a pencil or a pen. I don't care. Listen, it's not, I'm not, I don't, I'm just, I don't want to hear this. People just take their pen. <laughs> but they spend huge amounts of money on advertising. Now advertising on television. Yeah. Oh, advertising on television. Wow. Wow. How low can, I mean, wait, what's next? I mean, what's next? When I, when I was, when I was um, in the army, a drug rep mailed, a drug company mailed to my house and left on my doorknob a sample dose of Thorazine, a very powerful antipsychotic medication. I went, I went ballistic. I called them. I said, I have children at home. How could you do that? So that's how I've changed. How do patients without money receive health care early? Yeah. 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 Well, I, th I think, um, I, I'll just give you some examples, and that is that, you know, there's a law that you can't discount your, your, your medical bills. You can't, I can't offer you medicine at $10 an hour and him at $3 an hour. So you charge, everybody's got, got to be charged the same. Now whether you try and collect it at them, it's a different story. I basically didn't try and collect it. I just wrote it off. Um, I, I found it just very hard to go after people there's this sick person with rheumatoid arthritis who has no money because they're sick. Is it hypocritical of me to go after him to pay me when I know that he's, he's a poor person? Uh, Medicaid was always a problem. I think that for many years it, it cost doctors money to see Medicaid patients. They made no money from it. I think they, they would just, I don't know what they would do. but. Um, I just, you know, Medicaid would make you fill out these forms five and six times to get the money, and they just, they really worked very hard to make it difficult for you to be uh, a caring person, but I just, I just, you know, didn't spend a whole lot of time on it. So anyway, I'll, I'll make a long story short. I left private practice in 1980, went to work at UMass. I had all these unpaid, outstanding charges, <clears throat> and, uh, I wrote patients' letters and this and that, and I even hired a collection collection agency to do it. And the collection agency, you know, made a hundred dollars. I mean, it was nothing. And uh, geez, I felt terrible as they as I started. As they told me they were going to send this patient to, they're going to go to court for the judgment. And I said, no, 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 don't do that, God, you know. I just didn't want to do it. So I think that patients just got a lot of free care. Not a long answer to a short question. Do you think that everyone who needed care got it back then? No. What do I think they do today? Over the years, how do you think Worcester has compared to other places in terms of providing care for the underserved? I think pretty good. I think pretty good. Uh, I was at the UMass Medical Center in the primary care clinic for five years. I was the uh, head of that actually for five years. And I think we took all comers and rich, poor, or otherwise. And never made any kind of an economic barrier for them to come in and get care. Uh, we might have billed them and so forth, and, but I don't think we ever got much of that money. Also, you know, the Hill-Burton Act uh, states that every hospital that receives federal funds, which most do, have to, by law, give free medical care to patients of, of such and such income level. So, so I think most poor people get medical care, whether it's in an emergency room, do they see the same doctor, is it coordinated care, maybe not, I don't know. I think the people working in the emergency room and the outreach clinics do a great job, limited resources, so forth. Um, 
there some fears and concerns about socialized medicine in the 50s and 60s? Yeah. Godless communism was the major thing we were told was going to happen. If you, if you had uh, socialized medicine, the government was going to tell you how to practice medicine. You weren't going to make a living. Uh, you'd be harassed by rules and regulations. So here we are today with our, with our free enterprise system where you're harassed by rules and regulations. Doctors are making a lot of money, but they're really harassed. And they feel very threatened by, because of uh, the regulation and the, and the incredible cost of malpractice insurance which is, I think, a major of the factor in as to what goes on in, in the doctor's office. Did you see uh, physicians get involved politically on the topic of socialized medicine? You know what's interesting? In Massachusetts, no. Okay. I, think, I think Massachusetts physicians are by and large more liberal than doctors in the rest of the country, as is Massachusetts as a whole. It's a pretty liberal state. I think we, we live here by and large because this is where we want to be. These are the kind of people we want to be around. And also because the medical schools provide a f focus or a venue for academic excellence, for proliferation of real knowledge, for doing the right stuff, et cetera. So there are lots of doctors with academic appointments who go to grand rounds in medical schools, who teach medical students and residents, and so forth. And that's the life they're kind of interested in. What were your feelings on Medicare when it came around? You've talked about Medicaid already. Medicare has, has always been felt to be pretty benign. Medicare dramatically changed the socioeconomic status of people in the United States. Uh, the elderly were frequently very sick, got very little medical care because they had no money. And actually a, a big piece of national income suddenly went to these people. They can now, they didn't have to set aside all this money for Medicare. So they started retirement homes, they went to Florida, they bought RVs, they traveled, and they had to sequester their money to pay for this, these large medical bills they knew would be coming. So it turns out the average person is paying more out of pocket today than they were in 1965. The negative side of Medicare is that in the past five to ten years through the, something called HICFA, the Health Care Finance Agency, which is a piece of it, I think, they have really regulated the care down to the nuts and bolts of how to practice medicine, really telling doctors how to practice. Yeah. And it's just, that's just beyond stupid. I mean, it's really, I mean, if you think one size fits all, then that's, a, that, that'd be fine. You know, when someone comes into you with uh, coronary artery disease and that is having a biochemical function in your office, you won't get fully, I mean, you will be penalized if you don't ask him about his family history, about his habits, about uh, things he enjoys doing. I mean, it's crazy, the guy's dying. I mean, he's probably, you're, you're working very hard to, figure out a plan to save this man's life. I mean, they're supposed to be doing all this other secondary and tertiary stuff. Ridiculous. And doctors feel very harassed by that. Well, as the government's gotten more involved in health care and, I mean, as managed care has come around, have you seen physicians specifically be affected by all that? Well, for one thing, they're no longer an independent practice. They're, by and large, banded together to try and, uh, keep some kind of independence against the government, to keep some sense of income, and also because of these new regulations, there are many more expenses that will be generated by them. Uh, so they've gotten together and uh, hope to save some money, and maybe they have. And they've joined healthcare care organizations, they've joined, they've got to work for hospitals, they've sold their practices to hospitals, they've joined HMOs and IPOs and PPOs, etc. So it's dramatically changed the way medicine looks today. How have you seen just generally the public's access to health care be affected? I don't know the answer to that, really the answer to that. Uh, as the bureaucracies get larger and larger, 
it uh, seems that the patient's entry into the system is unpredictable. It's either easy access or very difficult. You know, you sit in the emergency room for 10 hours before you see somebody, or you walk into your doctor's office and see them in 10 minutes. I don't know. Uh, I think it always has been a problem, the access. Well, would you like to move on from the subject of managed care in the government, or do you have any further comments on all this? I think the managed care organizations, by and large, have not delivered the goods that they say they would even though they started out with a tax advantage because of a federal regulation that promoted them. The health maintenance and the health promotion aspect has really been overwhelmed by the insurance aspect of it that just a big insurance company. I think that doctors struggle with that. They also struggle with the need to make their health organization profitable uh, they're given targets of patients to see. That's, uh, that's greatly affected their uh, practice style, if you would, and so forth. I mean, if every doctor has to see 1,700 patients a year, and your style has not to do that, then, then either you get penalized economically or not. And I, and I don't know if that's right or not, you know. Maybe you're seeing the, the hardest, maybe the hardest, sickest patients come to you because you're the smartest doc. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, the, the hard question. How have doctor's salaries changed over the years? Yeah, wow. Wow. Uh, yeah. So uh, when I was an intern, I made $3,000 a year. Um, when I retired, I made over $100,000. And yet I wasn't, I wasn't even, I wasn't, I was nowhere near the average. They've increased dramatically far more than the uh, average income or the cost of living. And I think that's Medicare has, has done that. Yeah. Medicare is a good payer to doctors by and large. Been generous to doctors and fair. I mean, they said they're gonna pay it, they paid it. Uh, unlike, yeah. Uh, so some doctors have gotten really wealthy. And now you're getting the money from patients that you used to do charity work for. That that's a piece of it, yeah. And also, there's so much more money in the system. I, 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 I don't know how to say that. So you need some economist to help you with that. There's just so much more money in the system now, you know? When I was a medical student, the, many of the hospital employees used to live in the hospital. Now they get paid living wages, have homes and families. Nurses used to get paid nothing. They used to get paid under $100 a week, a nurse, a registered nurse. Then they get eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year. There's so many more people working in the hospital. The technicians, uh, the radiology, physical therapy, uh, nuclear medicine. Uh, and they demand, and, and rightfully so, a living wage, and a good wage for, for being an educated person. There's a lot more money, a lot more money. How has malpractice insurance, as well as its impact on doctors, changed? I'll tell you a story. So when I was in, I first went into practice. Oh, when I was a, when I was first a resident, an intern, whatever it was, my malpractice bill was seventy five dollars, seventy five dollars a year. And I got a statement from my malpractice carrier who was going to double it to uh, over a hundred dollars. I said, "How can you do that? It's not fair." That's says you ain't seen nothing yet, doc. This is just the beginning. What did I know? Well, I found out soon enough because my first year in practice, I was sued. And um, it was from out of the blue. It was totally unexpected. Like you would pull out papers and serve me with a suit. I was just, this was a guy I thought I was doing well with. I thought was wanted to be my friend. And he sued me. And I went to the lawyer's office and I saw afterwards that I had 800 pages of deposition. It took 16 hours. I said, what an incredible waste of time this was. Nine years later, the, the, the charges against me, the suit against me was dropped.
That's been an experience with almost everybody I know in medicine. Almost everyone has been sued. It's no longer felt to be a badge of dishonor. It just, it just goes with the territory. There's almost no correlation between true compensation for injured patients and malpractice. What it has done is driven up the cost of medicine phenomenally. If you're paying $100,000 in malpractice insurance this year, and it might be 200000 next year, like for a neurosurgeon, how much do you charge? What do you set your, 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 your fees? Your fees have to be in line with to stay in business, otherwise you're out of, you're out of business. So this has driven, this escalation in the malpractice has driven up the cost of medicine dramatically. Not, not necessarily where it goes, oh yeah, dramatically, because hospitals are sued also. A big piece of the total health care bill is, is caused by malpractice. Um, Massachusetts does not limit rewards for pain and suffering like other states do. Um, that also dries up the cost of malpractice. But more importantly, it's made patients appear to be potential litigants in the doctor's eye. Is this person going to sue me because of a bad outcome? You know, maybe, maybe the plan, the best plan to do is plan A, but it's risky. You know, there's not a lot of proof there. It's what I would choose for myself or my family. But if I offer that to the patient and it turns out badly, will they sue me? No, you know, maybe better to choose plan B, which I know in my heart of hearts is not as good as, but has a better track record and is a safer thing and is more the standard of care. Do you follow me? Yep. So I don't think the patients necessarily get the most innovative of care. I think the doctors order many, many tests to cover all the possibilities. The courts have held time and again that if a test is available and it's safe, it, your failure to do it is malpractice. If the patient, you know, if you, if you fail to do a test and it, it's, and the patient suffers because of that, and the indication may or may not be clear, you're still, you're still liable. I mean, you know, you and I may know that's bogus, but you know, juries think otherwise. They see some poor guy there, you know, <laughs> stroked out, and they want him, they want him money. So I think it's really affected every doc. Now, for example, I'm a retired doc. You know, there's no way, it's very, it'd be very difficult for me to go back as a, on a, as a part-time basis. I'd pay, just pay all that malpractice, take this incredible risk to my retirement for what? Uh, no, I, I think I've survived the malpractice game. But I would think that it's a major, major negative impact for physicians today, and one that they worry about a lot, and think about a lot, and talk about a lot, and hate to do it because it takes away from what they're trying to do, which is take care of patients. Yeah. We have a little under five minutes. Okay. Uh, well, would you like to talk more about changes in women's health and the experience of the female physician? No. Right. I don't want it that. How has Worcester been different from other places that you practice? Have you practiced really anywhere else? Yeah, I practice in Gloucester, okay. and Marlboro, and Worcester. Uh, Worcester's always had a uh, large, important hospitals that were the focus of medical care, and an important part of the community. It's always, the, I think, since the medical schools come to U UMass, the, that's really been a focus of excellence for the community, and has really lifted up all boats. Um, and I think the docks in Worcester is as good as anywhere I've been anywhere else in my travels. What have you really liked and uh, what have you disliked about practicing here in Worcester? <laughs> what I've disliked is some of the competitiveness, is the competitiveness from the, or the competition, that's a better word, that exists between the different hospitals. UMass Memorial and St. Vincent's. By and large, by the end, it seemed that people were divided up into one or three camps. And as the economic screws got tightened and the money kept pouring in, 
you get to make an identity in one of these three hospitals, and some of the collegiality started eroding. All right, um, with medicine being such a changing field, how have you seen yourself keeping up with the changes in terms of education? I mean, since you graduated from medical school. Well, one thing, I've retired. Right. So I don't, I don't know I'm need to do that to the same degree that I do now. I get my New England Journal of Medicine every week and I read that, and that's what I do. I go to an occasional annual meeting of the American College of Physicians, and that's what also done. And I wanted to thank one more thing, I know time is short. What also has changed is that when I, when I started out in the 1960s, the average doc continued working well into his 70s in his office until he died, and almost many of them died practicing medicine with their boots on. Today, I'm a typical representative, somebody who worked for an organization who retires in their 60s. So we have that to deal with. Then to answer your question about women physicians, obviously today 50% of, of the people in medical school are women. Uh, that was compared to less than 10% in, in my day. Uh, we'll see what happens as, as a result of that. Will it be a kinder, gentler, more caring world? I hope so. Just briefly comment on how public perceptions of doctors have changed over the years. Sure. I, I would think that back in the 60s and 70s, when I started out, the doctors were very much perceived like Marcus Welby. Somebody who practiced out of their home, in their community, was a member of their community, a member of their church or synagogue, and was in a local person who was well known, uh, etc. Today the doctor is seen as a, uh, by and large, as a member of an organization, you know, whether it's the Fallon plan or UMass or the VA, and he is seen as, he is seen as a representative of that organization. So how they view that organization mirrors how they view their doctor. Although everybody loves their doctor, they may not love that organization. So I think it's a bit of a mixed message. I don't know about the poll show. I think the doctors have gone down somewhat in the public perception, isn't it? I think so. Isn't that true? Yeah. Now, that's too bad.